Okay, why don't we um, come together and finish your last thought on the, at the table, whatever it is, your compelling story that you need to finish, whatever it is. Um, so it's really good to be with y'all. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I am kind of pinching myself that it's mid-February. Anybody else doing that? That uh, wondered what happened to January? It was a blur in our family and I'm sure a lot of y'all's as well. Um, and, but it's really, I love uh, being here. I love seeing everybody um, and studying what I think is one of the most profound pieces of scripture that there is. So there's, I'm going to lay my cards on the table right now. Um, so I was going to start with something different. I will get to it. It's this uh, flower here for a minute. Um, but so I need to tell you about uh, this guy that uh, became one of my closest friends. Um, he was a student in our college ministry back in Tennessee. He doesn't text me often, and he texted me today. And I just need to tell you about him. So his name is Matt. I uh, was one of the very first students. I started in that ministry in 1998. Matt was there, and Matt was on the 10-year plan for undergraduate college ministry. So um, uh, he was working a lot, and he ended up being our uh, drummer, our worship leader on staff with me, and, and now he serves at the church I used to serve at. And um, Matt had this wonderful <laughs> character that he did called Super Spiritual Guy. And Super Spiritual Guy... <laughs> Was, was like this, no matter what you would say about anything, Matt could turn it into some sort of spiritual teaching that would also might make you feel guilty. <laughs> so let me give you an example, because he just texted me today, I haven't heard from him in a couple months, and he literally just said, um, so super spiritual guy has been revived this time at Signal Mountain Presbyterian Church, where we used to serve. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. So you all know those little fluorescent uh, little people that you put out when, when you, to tell kids to slow down. It's got the flag on it and all that kind of stuff. So, so uh, this church uses this online communication platform called Slack. Dave and I, we're going to try to implement it here. It hasn't worked. Um, and so one of the, the children's ministry staff person at church it was really windy, I guess, on Signal Mountain, like it's been here. And so the children's ministry person said, hey, this afternoon, the safety boy was sliding all over the parking lot, so I placed him here, picture, out of the wind. Here comes super spiritual guy. You know, this reminds me, when we don't have a solid foundation in Jesus, the winds of this world will blow us all over the parking lot of our lives. There's an example of super spiritual guy. It gets better. Hold on. So then the middle school director, who was also a student in our ministry, um, tells the entire church staff, none of the toilets in the girls' bathroom in the cafe are currently flushing. I put a sign on the door that says out of order. Super spiritual guy's response, sometimes we just can't get rid of our sin. No matter how many times we try to flush it, it's still there in the toilet of our hearts. Thankfully, we don't have to put an out-of-order sign on our hearts. Jesus is the great plumber and has flushed our sin down the toilet. So I thought this was pretty timely, <laughs> given Matthew 5 and 6. Some of you might find that inappropriate, but whatever. Um, uh, so I thought it was appropriate. I told him, I said, I think you just gave me my opening illustration tonight. And I said, it's funny. And to which he responded, funny? or divine orchestration. So you can see what kind of guy Matt is. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about um, the continuation of what Jesus is teaching us about what's really in our hearts, what is really in our hearts. And, uh, and I wanted to start off today by sharing a little bit about my day um, in that today um, I, sat, I spent some time with um, Irene Ryder. Uh, who's a longtime member of our church, and uh, you may have heard uh, through various channels that her husband Dick uh, passed away yesterday morning. And, um, and Irene is 101 years old, and Dick was in his 90s. Um, and so I just went to their house, and I spent some time praying with them. And I just, as I often do when I sit with families that have lost someone, I just begin to ask them to tell their story of when they met. It's a beautiful story. They met here. 
um, through a program that was called Ambassadors, which Irene joked was the way that people in her generation all got married. It was a singles group, and they, she said, and all of us ended up marrying one another, and they met on a church trip to Yosemite. But they cut for me this camellia because Dick grafted a new uh, uh, version. I forget what the horticultural term for it is. And this is Lady Irene, named after Irene. So Dick grafted two varieties of camellia together, and they, they, they were talking about it and how much Dick loved to garden. And, and they also told a joke that, that Dick tried to breed one called King Richard, and it never took off. Um, but this is Lady Irene, and it, I wish you could see it up close because the I guess the, the variation in color that's dark pink on the outside it goes to the lighter pink in the middle and it's really beautiful it's really a beautiful flower and if you've read tonight's passage you know that Jesus looks at the flowers of the field and compares our our idea of beauty to what God has already created that God has marvelously made all of creation in such a beautiful way, if we would take the time to look at it. And that, that oftentimes in comparison to the way that, that we as human beings try to make beauty on our own, things like this just overshadow it all the time. And, and uh, I, there was a, a passage... Uh, let me, let me read for you. This is from a, a book called The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard, which, by the way, is a big chunk about the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what Willard says about this. The little flowers that grow wild on the hillsides, Jesus points out, effortlessly exhibit a radiance of beauty that the most powerful human beings fixed up to the greatest possible extent, quote Solomon in all his glory, cannot begin to match. Every word of that quote, by the way, is intentionally, I think, written. And this is much of Willard's kind of philosophy of discipleship, effortlessly exhibiting radiance of beauty. And I'm going to go on to say why, why, why that is important for us. And he, and he goes on and he says, if you look at one of these little flowers... And then at the strained ladies and floppy gentlemen who come out to opening nights and award dinners in our centers of power and culture, you can only feel sorry for the people. They can't even begin to compete. But as we live from God and God's world, a beauty is ours that overwhelms the flowers. So that's how I just kind of want to begin tonight. I think Willard's statement, what I got to you know, witness today, and just the, the beauty of Irene's testimony about her husband in the face of his death, um, and a, a concrete example of what beauty really is. Um, I just want to start there. Um, so I know my time is limited. The, the small group time is really important. Let me just say this at the beginning um, is a question to all of you and maybe to discuss at the table, though it's not in the workbook. Sorry, Dave, and the authors of the workbook. But let me just ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus is the greatest teacher about what it means to flourish as a human being? Do you believe that Jesus is the greatest teacher that has ever lived in history about what it means to flourish as a human being. Because that's why the Sermon on the Mount, his, great, his kind of greatest, longest teaching, is, is well regarded by people even of other faiths and traditions. I, I taught through the Sermon on the Mount a long time ago in our college ministry, and knowing that a lot of the college students there studied world religions, I brought in two books, one called The Good Heart by the Dalai Lama, and one called A Rabbi Talks with Jesus by Jacob Neusner. And both of them, a Jewish rabbi and the Dalai Lama, it looked at the Sermon on the Mount. 
And in many places they went, this is the most phenomenal teaching about what it means to be a human being, irregardless, did they claim that Jesus was the Son of God and the Messiah and Savior? No. But they could look at these words and say, this is extraordinary. So, so just stepping outside of our, you know, our context for a little bit and realize that when Jesus taught these words, this is why crowds followed. Because they, they as the scripture says, no one else taught like this. And the question for all of us is to really step back and say, do we take these words seriously? Would we read these words of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 especially and really believe that Jesus can speak to us 2,000 years later that these words still hold true and that they teach us now what it means to flourish truly as a human being? that he is the most brilliant teacher of the human condition that has ever lived. That's kind of the, the claim that Willard makes in the, in the divine conspiracy and, and one that I've been compelled with too. So um, now, I'm gonna disappoint tonight. Um, maybe I already have, uh, but I'm gonna disappoint because there's way too much to cover in this chapter, right? There's way too much. Um, and... But remember, as your workbook says, that, that this is all about Jesus is forming disciples. He's forming apprentices to his way of living. As the workbook says, a restored humanity. That's the goal. So Jesus is trying to uncover the things that have broken humanity, darkened our hearts, given us impure motives and all of the rest, and he's trying to restore humanity and make apprentices to his way of living inside and out. So very briefly, I'm not gonna go into depth. I'm gonna go into the latter part of the chapter. That's where I'm heading in the last 15 minutes. He takes three spiritual practices, giving, praying, and fasting, and gives them an overhaul, right? Right? And, and basically, I would sum it up like this. Instead, Jesus is saying, instead of doing these things for an audience of others, do them for an audience of one. Instead of giving, praying, or fasting in order to be seen by others, recognize that God really does see. God really does see. And the second question I guess I would, I would ask is that is the first one is, do we really believe that Jesus is the most brilliant teacher about the human condition that's ever lived? And the second one that, that this section leads us to ask is, do we really believe that God is present and sees? Because that's what Jesus is assuming and claiming, that any time you've ever done anything for anyone else and no one saw. Any time that you have simply called out to God and no one else heard, God heard. And God was there. So all those acts that you think have gone unnoticed, all those times and places of sacrifice and time and maybe giving, whatever, that, that no one has ever said thank you for, no one has ever noticed, Jesus is saying God saw. And God is re rewarding, okay? So what I really want to spend time, though, talking about tonight, I have multiple books up here, um, looking for the Bible, um, is the, the second part of the chapter um, in, in Matthew 6. So the first part is about these three practices of giving and praying and fasting, we could have a multi-week series, by the way, just on the Lord's Prayer, right? So, but, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. But here he unpacks for us, Jesus unpacks for us how much he knows what consumes our thinking. He knows. If you, if you want to challenge the claim, if you want to investigate the claim that Jesus knows about humanity... Look at Matthew 6, 19 through 34, and tell me this doesn't still speak today. He speaks, if you haven't gotten there, about 
the treasures we store up here on earth for ourselves, that we cannot serve both God and money. And then he begins to talk about the things that makes us anxious and causes us worry. Do you see how brilliant it is that, that someone that walked on this earth in an entirely different context, different culture, different time, spoke these words and they sound the same to our ears as they did to the original audience. There is something different about this kind of teaching because we can read it and hear it and understand it and even try to apply some of it in a vastly different world, in a vastly different world. So um, what, what Jesus is, is saying here is, is talking about the, the, that the things that we spend our time caring about is where our heart ends up. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, he says. And then interestingly, it's, it's, it sounds at first glance like a little bit of a different parable when he starts talking about our eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. But as James will point out in a, in a letter later, um, that we understand that oftentimes our value of things is drawn by the things that we see. So it's an, not an uncommon experience that has happened in the Burke household. We've been watching a little bit of the work, Winter Olympics at night, and our kids are fascinated by the commercials. Because if you think about it, they've grown up in a world where they can watch and binge watch and stream things, and there are no commercials. Super Bowl had tons of commercials. We won't get into all of that. But, but it is not an uncommon experience for my kids to say, watch a commercial, and what do, they think, what do you think the next words out of their mouth are? What? I want one of those. Yeah. I'll give you a real-life example of the Burke household. Have you all seen that, the ad where um, it's kind of dark a little bit? It's for the Apple Watch where someone's calling, they've been in an accident from an Apple Watch, and, and, and it's recordings of people that said, I've just been hit, you know, will you send 911 and all that kind of stuff? You know what my kids have been saying? Dad, don't you love us? I mean, this is actual quotes, okay? <laughs> you know, they're being a little, sort. Dad, don't you care? I need an Apple Watch. I was talking with a friend, pastor friend of mine about this, and they said, this is what you should do. You should say, okay, I'll get you an Apple Watch. Just give me the phone. <laughs> and I tried that with one of my kids, and they were like, no, I'm good. I'm good. So my point is this, is that, that Jesus knows the eye is the lamp of the body. And when we talk about the things that we want, the treasures that we want, it's often because of what, we, what we've seen. We don't know that we want it until we see it. And so he's, he's, in, he's inviting us to say, consider what it is you see. Or maybe as you notice what you see, ask yourself, I really need that? Want that? What is that? Why is that, why is that shiny thing drawing me in so much? You know, we can just think back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. When Eve saw that it was pleasing to the eye and good for food, she took it. Way back then, that line about pleasing to the eye is a thread that weaves its way through all of Scripture. And we see it here, too. Um, it goes on, and, and it obviously says that none of us can really serve two masters. You'll either be devoted to this idea of possessions and acquiring, or you will be devoted to, to God. These are hard words. They're, they are meant to cause us to examine our hearts and our priorities. And in the time I, I have left, I just want to talk about how much I love that Jesus talks about worry and anxiety. Because that's, that's, I think we all know we live in a world where that is such a prevalent thing all around us, among us, in all that we've lived through as a as a country and as a world the last couple of years, we see it in our children. 
We see it in younger generations in rising, um, in rising ways. And here Jesus is, is trying to point all of us again to that belief. Do we believe that God sees us and sees what we need? Whether it be food or, or clothing, he gets to the idea of, of whether we consider ourselves as having worth in God's eyes. And he talks about the birds of the air, and then he talks about the flowers of the field, this beautiful illustration of just looking out. And we're living in this time right now here in Sacramento, where I think it's maybe a little early, but we're seeing the flowers come. My son, who lives in Virginia, is still under snow and ice and all that kind of stuff. They don't have flowers there. But right now, we can see what Jesus is talking about, how even embedded into the fabric of creation, God has shown what beauty looks like, as Willard says, effortlessly its radiance comes forth. And the promise is, is that, that as we really listen to Jesus and trust in his word, as we really seek to know him and trust that he has the words of eternal life, we too could exude that same kind of beauty without necessarily trying all the time. That these disciplines of life, this, the discipline that you all have been engaging in since you began in January, gathering together and studying, is producing in you a particular kind of person. It's not instantaneous, right? But good change never is, right? Good change does not happen overnight. And what Jesus is promising is, just keep walking with me. Just keep walking in a community. Study these words. Study my way. Trust me that God will provide. God is with you. God sees you. And that you don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is meant to be funny, by the way. Tomorrow will worry about itself. And that the, the essence of that teaching is that, that we can trust him, trust him to provide all that we need, whatever that need is. It's, it's embedded in the story of God's people, of, of you know, providing manna in the desert as they wandered through the wilderness. That was an early part of the story. Even before that, when God provided clothing for Adam and Eve after they broke his one commandment, that God always provides for his people no matter what. And that is what Jesus is pointing to here for us as well, that we, we don't have to run around so much and worry about all these things that we, we spend our time worrying about them. It doesn't it doesn't mean that um, Jesus is preaching inaction. There's a little bit of a clarification there. It's not that he's preaching inaction. He's, he's asking us to examine our hearts about where we think this stuff really comes from. Where do we think this stuff really comes from? If we have a job and that job pays us, do we see that we got that job because of our our, you know, our own giftedness and, you know, all that kind of stuff? Or do we really believe that God was the source of that good blessing? Do we really believe and see him as the source of that? And even the gifts that, that may have landed us that job. This doesn't diminish any of that, but do we see that as God again? I gave you those gifts to get that job to provide and then these things but God is still the source of it all because underneath I think what Jesus is saying here is a is is combating that fear that we have that if we don't try hard enough if we don't keep working at it if we don't pursue it it all falls apart because I think any of us that have gone through a, a, a time in which things were less, like we had less, or lost a job, or, or didn't know 
how we were gonna pay for things. And somehow we made it through the generosity of others or gifts that were unexpected. I think any of us that had a story, maybe you've got one around your table. And yes, we can point to the names and the people that did those things for us. But I would guess that many of those people that were generous to you did that because of their understanding of God in their life and what God has done for them. So I encourage you all as you gather around your tables tonight to maybe, um, I know that the workbook kind of talks about um, about the, the earthly treasures. And then again, the, the question that you all end with, I think every, every time, what aspect of God's character have you seen most clearly through this? But I'd encourage you to, to um, as you, as you gather back around the tables, to maybe focus on the second part of this chapter, the part about where our treasure is, whom it is that we're serving, and whom it is that we believe comes the source of all these good things, and whether or not worry accomplishes anything at all. So I'll leave you with that, and uh, you can go to your discussion around your table.